Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome. My name is Ray Perman. I'm director of the David Hume Institute and welcome to the second in our series of autumn seminars. Uh, I'll talk a, a little bit more about this evening in a moment, but I just want to point you to the, to the next two because um, they're of very good value and I would book up well in advance. Uh, the next one on the 12th of November, we're looking at uh, measuring well-being, well-being playing an increasing role in uh, uh, the thinking about policy and uh, some very interesting work has been done by the University's Institute, um, the Scottish Futures Forum and the Carnegie Trust, among others, and we'll be hearing more about that. And then later in November, presidential lecture from Anton Muscatelli, who, uh, as you all know, is president of the David Hume Institute and um, has another job, I think, as principal of the University of Glasgow. But he is an economist in his own right and is going to be continuing the theme that we're starting tonight on inequality, giving it a national and international context. Well, this evening, we're very privileged to have Professor David Bell, who has been doing some original research on inequality for the David Hume Institute, um, kindly funded by Alan McFarlane. We heard a lot during the referendum campaign about fairness, creating a fairer Scotland. But what do we need, mean by fairness? What is uh, fairness in Scotland? Is Scotland any more or less fair than other parts of the UK or other countries for that matter? And where does inequality uh, manifest itself and what effect does it have uh, on policy, particularly on communities? We asked David to do some groundwork and, and fill in some of the answers to those questions for us, and we're very much uh, hoping that this work will lead on to further work by the team that David leads at the University of Stirling um, into the policy implications around inequality. Uh, I'm going to hand over very shortly to David, but then after that, Stephen Boyle, who uh, is a trustee of the David Hume Institute and also chief economist of the Royal Bank of Scotland, will chair the discussion after, the, uh, after David has finished his presentation. Um, at the very end of the discussion, or it may not be the end, Stephen may have to cut you all off if we're running out of time, but we'll be giving you a drink in the foyer there so you can continue the discussion there. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Professor David Bell. Thanks, Ray. <coughs> um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so I have, let me say straight away, I have far too many slides. So uh, I shall uh, maybe uh, uh, um, gloss over some of them. Uh, we have, uh, I along with my co-author, David Iser, who sat in the front, um, have produced quite a lengthy paper, which is on the David Hume website now. Uh, and which was commented on, or some aspects of it were commented on in the uh, press last week. Uh, what I want to do is to uh, discuss around six issues at varying degrees of speed. Uh, the first one, which I'll do quite quickly, uh, is to reflect a little bit on how inequality has moved up uh, the um, policy agenda uh, in, particularly in the last few months, with amazing rapidity. Um, it is not something that we tend to talk about all that much in, uh, in uh, economics courses, uh, yet uh, uh, it has caught the attention of a large number of influential policymakers in economics and obviously in other disciplines in the last little while. I'm going to talk a little bit about measuring inequality because it, do it is very important how you measure it what kind of conclusions you're going to come to. Then I'm going to step back and look at the Scottish labour market uh, over the period 1984 through to the present day and think about how the many changes that have happened in the Scottish labour market over that period of time have themselves caused increases or decreases in inequality as a kind of byproduct. I'll talk a little bit about policy interventions that are intended to uh, affect inequality, that are, whose objective is to redistribute, um, uh, and all governments are involved in that to a greater or lesser extent. 
And then I'll talk about policy intervention whose unintended consequence is a change in the level of inequality. And that's particularly what we've been looking at uh, for uh, the David Hume Institute. And hopefully I'll draw some conclusions at the end. So I'll first of all go through a series of slides quite quickly. And they're quotations from various um, uh, policymakers uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, so here is uh, Jing Jim Yong Kim, who actually was principal of Dartmouth College, but went from there suddenly to become president of the World Bank, uh, who said, for the first time in the history of the World Bank Group, we have set a goal that aims to reduce global inequality as the spread, so it's obviously up to date, of the Ebola virus in West Africa shows the importance of this objective could not be more clear. Then we've got the OECD, which traditionally didn't take a huge interest in inequality, saying quite apart from their implications for well-being and social cohesion, inequalities come at a profound economic cost. New work from the OECD has highlighted how rising inequalities have neg negatively impacted economic growth, thwarting opportunity and cutting vulnerable groups off from the heartbeat of our economies. The result is stifled economic growth over the long term. Then, Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Business and political leaders at the World Economic Forum should remember that in far too many countries, the benefits of growth are being enjoyed by far too few people. This is not a recipe for stability and sustainability. Again, the IMF is not uh, an institution that you would normally imagine uh, uh, worried too greatly about equality. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Haldane, chief economist from the Bank of England in its two Twin Peaks uh, uh, speech last week. Several factors have been put forward to support the secular stagnation hypothesis, the notion that many of the developed countries at the moment are in a period of secular stagnation, effectively nil or close to nil growth. They include rising levels of inequality, worsening levels of educational attainment, a high debt overhang, lower prices for investment goods, rising levels of youth unemployment and lower levels of innovation. But inequality is in there as one of the possible explanations. I won't go through what Mark Carney said, but I will uh, finish with a very influential person, Janet Yellen, just speaking last week. And she said, it is no secret that the past few decades of widening inequality can be summed up as significant income and wealth gains for those at the very top and stagnant uh, living standards for the majority. I think it is appropriate to ask whether this trend is compatible with values rooted in our nation's history, that is the US, among them the high value Americans have traditionally placed on equality of opportunity. So that's a range of people at the top of various national and international organizations who are clearly putting inequality at the top of their list of concerns. And that partly uh, is explained by changing views of inequality. There is a huge economics literature on this, and I'm not uh, going to try to summarize it in, uh, in a great detail. Uh, one of the contributions that is very well known is by Kuznets, who argued that as economies develop, they will go through a period of rising inequality, but that will <coughs> come to an end, and that you'll get a kind of uh, hump with inequality rising and then falling. The important work by Piketty uh, earlier this year argues that in contrast, there is no general tendency towards greater economic equality. And there is also no evidence that wealth will be distribute, di distributed more equally because human capital, a form of wealth, will not be or has not shown any, um, <clears throat> there is no evidence to show that it crowds out other forms of wealth, property, capital, and so on. So wealth inequalities are now as large as they were in the 19th century. So it is important, however, to think, to, to take a carefully considered view when thinking about trying to affect the level of inequality. 
the extent to which government policy can do that is to some extent limited. It's limited by a, a whole bunch of economic forces. Globalization, the, the, the substantially faster growth in international trade than in world GDP over the last 30, 40 years has affected uh, uh, different parts of our income distribution differently. It affects uh, people, who, obviously, those who lose out uh, uh, are, are affected by, uh, by globalization. That takes a chunk of people out of the income distribution and may affect the overall level of inequality. Technological change, the impact in particular of computers over the last 30 years or so, Institutional change, one that I would pick out would be the, uh, the uh, declining influence, say, in the US and the UK of trade unions uh, as, and what effect they may have on, uh, on uh, inequality. Demographic change, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on, so I won't dwell on that now, but it does matter. There are a whole variety of social changes that are taking place. Uh, the way that households form has changed vastly in the last 30 or 40 years. And that affects inequality because, well, at least on one perspective, we think about inequality at the household level. So how households are formed matters. And then there's my favorite uh, topic, a sort of mating, uh, which uh, has all to do with uh, St. Andrews and the reason why St. Andrews will continue as a university for many centuries to come. Uh, we have all these MOOCs and so on for uh, teaching millions uh, of um, students at once, but that is not St. Andrew's function. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> whether that uh, will have a... Well, I'll come back to that. Uh, then we have... In the intended, a set of policies that are intended to influence uh, uh, distribution, redistribution, the tax system, the benefit system, the tax credit system, they all affect uh, a, the balance uh, between people's wages uh, before what we call their market wage and the actual wage that they have to buy goods and services with their disposable income. <clears throat> then if you think more broadly about income, government spending matters because uh, the, the government uh, provides certain goods free or certain goods at below market cost. How those are allocated also, if you take this broader view of income distribution, also might matter. Policies like the minimum wage or the living wage might also for example, by putting a, a lower floor on the income distribution also affect the level of, of, of equality or inequality. Then there are a set of policies whose unintended consequence is a change in the level of inequality, uh, policies that address objectives other than redistribution. And here you might think about housing policy or energy policy or competition policy that indirectly result in changes in uh, income distribution. Uh, uh, market regulation may also have redistributive effects. Okay. Let me go on then to measuring inequality. It seems I'm just going to grab some water, I think. To talk about measuring inequality because <clears throat> There, had, there was a lot of discussion during the referendum campaign about inequality and uh, implications that one side or the other could make uh, Scotland a fairer society. F to economists, this is uh, quite imprecise because wh what exactly are you talking about when, you, when you're using this word inequality? It does matter how you uh, <coughs> conceptualize it. And there are many, many ways to do this, of course, Economists can't agree about anything, but it is important to understand that there are different ways of thinking about inequality and measuring inequality. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about 
inequality of income or inequality of wealth? Are we thinking about inequality at the individual level, which is mostly about the kinds of income that people are receiving uh, in terms of a wage, earnings, uh, uh, at that level, or are you worried about household income, which is, as I said earlier, the amount of money that a household can bring to bear to purchase goods and services? Are we thinking about before or after taxes and benefits? That's, uh, that's important because the after taxes and benefits measures the extent to which the government is trying to make the distribution of income more even. Are you thinking about uh, including or excluding the social wage? So that is the set of goods that the government might provide uh, to you, not through the market mechanism. So that's non-market uh, uh, benefits, such as in the, in the UK, the NHS. Are we thinking about in real or in nominal terms? Are we thinking about how the price level itself may affect the distribution of income because the poor may have to pay more for certain goods? So they may, <coughs> they may have uh, uh, an income that is on average, say, half the median, but because they are facing a different set of prices, the, their command over goods and services is actually uh, um, less than that implied by their, their already low income. Are we thinking about a cross-section, so a single point in time, or are we thinking about intergenerational uh, inequality? That's a big issue because one thing that does seem to me to be clear from the data for the, the, the last few years is that the young uh, are, current, are losing out in all kinds of ways relative to baby boomers like me. Uh, and then over what time period? Uh, Piketty has done a huge amount of work uh, tracing inequality way back into the 19th century. Uh, and uh, the time period really matters. Uh, one of the measures that is often used is the, is the so-called Gini coefficient, and I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, I've got a, a diagram here which shows how earnings in Scotland are distributed, and that's the blue line shows that. And it puts uh, people's income in rank order from the lowest to the, uh, the uh, largest. And it, as you go up, the, uh, the proportion of the population along the horizontal axis, you work out what proportion of the total income this group has earned. So as you go up, you start off very slowly, and then at the end, you, it increases pretty rapidly because those at the very top are accounting for a large chunk of the uh, earnings. So the data from Scotland for the most recent year that we've got available shows that the top 2% of uh, earners account for 12% of total earnings, and the bottom 34% account for exactly the same proportion of total earnings. So <clears throat> that suggests a degree of inequality. And the Gini coefficient is broadly, can be easily interpreted. It's the area up between this uh, 45 degree line, which would be the line that would uh, be traced out if everyone got the same wage, and then the, and the actual line, so it measures this area broadly. So that's one way of measuring inequality. It's a very, very popular way. You'll see it, uh, you'll see it quoted quite a lot. There are others. Uh, this is, again, uh, Scottish, in this, in this case, household incomes um, uh, with uh, their incomes in, uh, the, split by percentiles but ranked again from the smallest to the largest. And uh, this is a weekly net income here. So it's about 200 pounds there. 10% of people live in households with net income less than 220 pounds a week. So that's um, the net income, the actual income they have to bear, that they can use to buy goods and services. Uh, half the population live in households with 440, net income over 440. 10% live in households with net income over 
850. So one way, another way that you might uh, measure inequality is just to take the ratio between those at the 90th percentile and those at the 10th, that's the 90 10 percentile. So it, the answer is 3.86. That's a different measure of inequality. And one thing to notice about it is that it only, take, it only matters uh, where the 10th percentile is and the 90th percentile is, whereas the Gini coefficient takes account of every uh, part of the income distribution. Nevertheless, 90 tens are quite often quoted as well. And in fact, here is the ratio of the 90th to the 10th for full-time workers in Scotland from 1975 to 2012. The ratio of the 90th to the 10th percentile for full-time workers' weekly earnings. And where you, what you notice from this is that most of the action actually took place in the 1980s. That was when the big increase in inequality for full-time workers actually took place. And since then, what has happened has been a kind of bumbling along in terms of uh, inequality. Now, that may uh, not agree with people's perceptions, but be careful what I've said. I've used the 90th to the 10th, and I've also said full-time workers. That's important, and I'll come back to that. Because actually, if you take, for example, the change from 1997 to 2009 in uh, <coughs> what has happened percentile by percentile in terms of the increase in total income, the top 2% have actually appropriated an increasing share of total income over that period. And of course, the 90th to the 10th percentile doesn't pick that up because uh, the 90th is there, nothing much has happened there. The 10th is there, nothing much has happened there. So you have to be very careful about how you uh, measure inequality and uh, <coughs> that you understand uh, what it means. So what we've seen, and this is a, a UK comparison, is a rise of the top 1% uh, in uh, uh, 1997 they accounted for 6.3% of income, in 2009 they accounted for 9.4%. In the rest of the UK the proportions are pretty much the same. The big difference in the UK is not between Scotland and uh, uh, all of the rest of England except London. The growth in inequality in London has exceeded that in Scotland and in the rest of the UK quite considerably. And in fact, this graph shows a period, the, the Gini coefficient, which does respond to some extent to the top uh, income earners, uh, for the period <coughs> from 1961 through to 2012. So the 60s were a period of uh, no um, significant change in inequality and many people have thought that the 60s were the um, kind of historical standard and that inequality would revert to that kind of level. But there's no evidence that it, that it will revert to that kind of level. The increase during the 1980s, um, then the levelling off, but continuing increase in uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, sorry, in London. That's, that's the London uh, uh, Gini coefficient. So, how about international comparisons? Well, this is the Gini coefficient for 34 OECD countries. Uh, for, uh, uh, in the, 2000, the publication was for 2014, but the data will just be the most uh, up-to-date that is available. Measures of inequality. Uh, Chile, Mexico, Turkey, London. The United States, Israel, the United Kingdom. But if you take London out of the United Kingdom, Scotland's way down there. And the rest of GB is, is not much different. From, from Scotland. So 
it is important to realise the, the effect that London has as a driver of overall uh, inequality in the UK. OK, let me now move on to discuss some of the changes that have happened in the Scottish labour market and speculate, rather than do a, uh, a, a, a statistical test, but speculate a little bit about their effects on inequality. Um, so clearly, the Scottish labour market over the last 30 years has experienced substantial change. And we've looked for, in, in this project, in some detail at individual level data using the labour force survey. Comparisons that we would have liked to make are a little bit, some of them are a little bit difficult because of changes in classifications. So the way that occupations are classified has changed radically uh, since uh, the beginning of this period. The way that industries are classified has changed uh, ra uh, radically and educational uh, qualifications. We've chosen four years um, one might argue that with, uh, with the years, but we, we tried to basically choose them 10 years apart where we had good data from the Labour Force Survey. That's why we've got 1984 rather than 1983. But of course, 1984 was the year of the miners' strike. It was a, a, a pivotal year in British uh, economic history. There's just no question about that. It was a pivotal year in British economic history. And that was the year that we started. Um, this has nothing to do with the uh, minor strike. This is the change, um, firstly, in the age structure of the population, and secondly, in part-time working in the population. So the age structure in 1984 was heavily biased towards the young. In 2013 we've got the baby boomers here and then uh, the uh, echo of the baby boom uh, later on. We also, over this period, saw a substantial rise in part-time working, and that's very important. In the early 80s, very few young, well, relatively few young people worked part-time. That's much, much more common now. It, it's part of the explanation of why the young are doing relatively badly, but it also has an effect on inequality because if, uh, if the 1980s were classified as a time where most workers worked full-time, and then you move up to the present where the balance has much more moved towards part-time, and part-time workers are working fewer hours, and if you're measuring inequality on a weekly wage basis, then you will inevitably see an increase in equality because of the increase in part-time working. Now, do you say that's a good thing or a bad thing? Depends what the people who are working part-time think. Is this what suits them, or would they prefer to work longer hours? So that's one of the major changes. So the workforce has aged, and also there's more part-time working. And here is uh, a little uh, 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 table which helps uh, not only explain what's happened in terms of um, uh, part-time workers, but also self-employed. So uh, let's just say, let's make an index of 100 in 1984 for employees, full-time employees, part-time, and self, the self-employed, and look at the growth so we just focus on the growth over that period, 1984 through to 2013. Full-time employees, have, have, the number has increased by 6%. The number of part-time employees has increased by 62%. And the number of self-employed people has increased by 67%. Huge difference in the rate of growth there. Now, just focusing on the self-employed for a second, Wages among the self-employed or earnings among the self-employed are much more widely distributed than they are among employees. You've got some very high-flying self-employed people who earn a lot, and then uh, amongst the, uh, the uh, uh, well, there are a group of people who 
uh, I think particularly in the present recession, have been in a sense forced to become self-employed. Uh, that is their only market option. They cannot find work, so they become taxi drivers. Uh, and they uh, often are at the bottom of the income distribution. So this these, both of these growth have very significant effects on overall inequality. Huge change here. The, the, the blue line shows the number of people largely women, I'm not going to be sexist at this point, so I'm not coming to an immediate judgment about that, but I suspect this is largely women, who describe themselves as looking after the family home. That's the 1984 numbers by age, and these are the 2013 numbers by age. Seen a huge influx of women into the labor market. That is bound to have an effect on inequality, depending on where they are coming into the labor market, which part of the income distribution uh, are, they, uh, are they entering uh, at? Another substantial change, qualifications. So uh, here we've got the number who are in the Scottish labor market who have no qualifications whatsoever has fallen dramatically from around 700,000 to about 120,000 over this period. The number of graduates has increased very substantially from under 100,000 to more than 400,000. And uh, interestingly, the number of female graduates now uh, outstrips the number of men, uh, male graduates over this period. That's bound to have an effect on, on inequality. Graduates tend to have what's called the graduate premium which uh, is the difference between what they earn and others earn. Those with no qualifications uh, uh, equally tend to have very low earnings relative to the qualified. So it's not absolutely clear what, this, what the net effect of all of this might be, but clearly that was a substantial change. The change in... Uh, uh, wages over the, period, over the time period is also very interesting. Let's just fix the, the prime age workers, those aged 40 to 44, at 100, and look at the changes in wages, firstly from the period, and this is because the data only allowed us to do this, 1984 to 2001, and 2003 to 2013. What you see is that the old do badly between 1984 and 2001, but do well in, uh, in, re in, the re in the last decade. All the workers have actually had a very good recession, whereas the young have been doing badly in both, were doing badly in bo during both periods. So again, this gap between the wages of the young and uh, uh, the older workers uh, is quite important. It is, though, you have to be quite careful because having more students means that there are more young people taken out of the labor market for a period of time. And so those aged 16 to 19 who are working are, are less likely um, to be on average as skilled as uh, uh, now as, they, as their equivalents 30 years ago. Uh, who might have gone to university but instead chose not or were not able to. Now, um, occupational change is, is an important change and this touches on an argument that I'll, I'll come on to which is about the hollowing out of the labour market and the hollowing out and the possibility that that creates a group of people at the bottom end of the labour market and another group at the top and what effect they, that has. Um, we aren't able to do direct comparisons uh, uh, over time, but what I can do is list the most common occupations in 1984 and in 2013. Other clerks and cashiers, pretty much gone. Technical change, computerization. Sales and retail assistants actually have grown. Personal contact, not the same as processing 
forms. Care workers and home carers, again, personal contact, but meeting a need which has grown dramatically over, this, over the last 30 or so years. Um, <clears throat> and there have been you know, changes like waiters and waitresses because we now uh, go out much more than we used to. Personal contact, not easy to substitute a technology for a waiter. Um, and so various, uh, various of these changes, I'll come back to that. Um, uh, now a really scary slide because um, uh, this is some work on the US by some guys in Oxford and part of the argument about the decline in some occupations was that they've been, because they're routine they can be uh, substituted by information technology so some of the fitters uh, some skilled manual jobs have actually disappeared because they've been substituted out by technology. Uh, Frey and Osborne's argument is that computers are now going beyond routine tasks. There are very good uh, systems now available to do medical diagnosis, for example. Computers can now drive cars. So what they did was to look at um, which occupations in the US are um, susceptible to uh, information technology changes over the next few decades. And they argued that com the, the computers have bottlenecks. There are areas where computers will take quite a while to make an impact perception and manipulation, um, a tasks that involve uh, a great de degree of manipulating or, or high manual dexterity, they argue, are, are still to some extent the domain of, of humans. Creative intelligence, writing plays, uh, creating art, still the domain of individuals, and social tasks, the waitresses, the retail assistants, the care workers, quite difficult to substitute. What they, however, found was that once you take account of these bottlenecks, it's still the case that 47% of US employment is in the high risk category, that they, over the next while, they could be uh, substituted out. Okay, so that, was, that, that kind of thinking lay behind the previous slide about, about occupational change. We've had a huge amount of industrial change and the people at the back haven't got a hope of seeing this. So, so this maybe is more about um, globalization, the effects of globalization. We've heard at the weekend that the last major uh, uh, underground coal mine in the UK may be closing. In Scotland in 1984, there were 26,000 people employed in deep coal mines. In shipbuilding and repair, there were 31,000 people in Scotland employed uh, in, these, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in that industry, and so on and so forth. There are still quite a few that actually haven't changed that much, but globalization where uh, Scottish workers are to some extent exposed to competition from workers in other parts of the world who are potentially lower cost, producing the same goods, uh, has had quite a dramatic effect on Scottish, uh, Scottish industrial structure. That slide is in the paper and uh, I'll let you uh, uh, peruse it at your uh, will. So, let me talk about intended consequences of policy. I've mentioned this already. Personal taxation and benefits, redistribution, income tax, property tax, capital gains, inheritance tax, etc. seek to redistribute from the rich to the poor. poor. Got a set of benefits that uh, work in the opposite direction, low income, out of work benefits, pensions, state pensions, uh, and tax credits. Labor market regu regulation, things about 
minimum or the living wage, trade unions and collective bargaining legislation. Of course, some of these may not necessarily be intended to redistribute. Um, depends how these go. And then increased in-kind spending aimed at the relatively poor to increase the social wage, spending on education to reduce the attainment gap, uh, uh, increased spending on health, uh, I haven't gone into the consequences of inequality, but the consequences of inequality arguably are most important in relation to health. I haven't got time to talk about that uh, in this lecture. There are, of course, also more universal benefits available in Scotland, but, uh, uh, types of spending which benefit the rich as well as the poor, and you might take as an example of that free prescriptions, uh, free tuition, uh, and um, free uh, bus passes. Bus passes. <laughs> I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> okay, uh, right, so um, a good question to ask is how much effort does the UK put into redistribution? And actually, uh, what I've done here is to rank countries from Korea, which does very little, uh, through to Ireland, which does quite a lot, to redistribute. So you've got the market wage on the one hand, and then you've got the, the wage which households have to um, bring to uh, buy goods and services. So they may have been increased by benefits or and reduced by taxes. So uh, countries, as this uh, blue line or blue bars increase, countries are making increased effort to redistribute. So the UK actually comes out sort of slightly better than the middle. Um, and the height of this bar is the overall level of inequality. So <clears throat> it's uh, the net uh, income inequality is here. The overall level of uh, inequality, market inequality is here. So the UK, as we saw earlier, has a pretty high level of inequality by international standards. But it makes uh, uh, seemingly a uh, uh, reasonable effort to, uh, to uh, redistribute. The direct taxes uh, contribute about 4% of the difference in the Gini curve between that income distribution, the market income distribution, and this one, the post-tax and benefit income distribution. Benefits do the main heavy lifting in terms of uh, uh, improving the circumstances of the poor. However, this is a different perspective. Because the UK already has quite a high level of inequality, you don't need to do uh, uh, all that much to actually appear to have quite a significant effect on uh, a post-tax inequality. If you're, if you're already everybody was equal, then your efforts would come to nothing. Your, your efforts to redistribute would come to nothing. If you're already quite unequal, then you don't have to do quite so much to reduce the level of inequality. And this <coughs> graph shows the uh, market genie and the uh, e amount of redistribution. And the UK actually, in terms of the amount of redistribution, does slightly less than, than the uh, average shown by this line, given its uh, level of um, overall level of inequality. We have a, mo a model at Sterling, and this, was, this, is, this is an important point, and one that we made in a previous paper. And it's, it's a point that basically says that market inequality in Scotland is at such a high level that trying to redistribute solely on the basis of taxes and benefits is probably unrealistic. And I think a lot of people think that having control over taxes and benefits could make a huge difference to the level of fairness, the level of equality in 
Scotland. What this does is use a model that we've constructed to show how much change in the Gini coefficient. It's about, it's about point, uh, <coughs> on this scale, uh, it's, a, it's about 40, I think, uh, he said. And if you add a penny on the basic rate of income tax, yes, you reduce inequality, but by a pretty small amount. Same if you put it on the higher rate, in fact, even less, because fewer people pay, and so on. One pence on the Scottish rate of income tax will generate £232 million, pounds, but, uh, and will have some effect on inequality, but still, against the overall level of inequality, it isn't doing all that much. And I won't go into the, uh, the further uh, issues there. The general point is the one that I'd already made. You let me talk a little bit about the living wage, and this is a little bit controversial um, because our, um, what's happened with a minimum wage is that it was introduced in 1999 at 46% of the uh, median wage. It has fallen slightly in real terms, but it's now 54% of the median, and the evidence suggests it has contributed to the reduction in inequality of wages in the bottom half of the wage distribution, and the effect has been greatest for the young. Our modeling, uh, looking at the living wage set at £7.40, is that it would reduce net household income by a quarter of 1%. And the argu our argument here actually is that, and, and this is, you have to be careful about how, uh, what conclusions you draw from uh, a seemingly simple measure like this. You have to think about well, how are, are low-wage workers actually distributed across household incomes? And the answer is that actually there are quite a lot of low-wage workers in households which have quite high household incomes. And that's because other people in the household are earning quite a lot. So you have to be careful uh, when thinking, th when clear, if, you, if you're trying to think something like this through clearly, you have to do the modelling to see what households are going to be affected by a, m a measure like this and what effects will there be. And we're, we're a bit, we're a, well, let's say we're, we're a bit ambivalent at the moment. It's not, it's not quite so clear, we think, as perhaps the uh, people are being led to believe. I won't go through the detail of that. Happy to come back to it. Talk a little bit about the unintended consequences of policy. And uh, this is uh, uh, interesting in a number of ways. This is, um, it is the case that, that uh, countries across the developed world have found it more and more difficult to raise ta direct taxes. Taxes on individuals, income tax, and uh, corporate and on corporations. Corporation tax, if you look at how corporation tax has changed in different countries for the last 20 years, it's clear the rate is going down. There is almost a convergence on the Irish rate of 12.5%. We're not quite there yet, but that looks like where it's going. Um, of course, governments have also found it, especially in the UK, politically difficult to increase the headline rate of income tax. So what do they do? They shift from uh, direct taxes to indirect taxes. And what you see happening is that um, uh, in terms of uh, in the uh, 1970s compared with 2012, uh, uh, the basic rate of income tax was then between 30 and 35 percent. It's now 20. The higher rate ranged between 40 and 83. It's now 40 to 50. So direct tax rates have come down. VAT has gone up from 8 percent to 20 percent. Petrol, the percentage of the retail price that's taken in tax was 47 percent. It's now 58. On diesel, uh, similarly, on wine, it's gone up to 62%. On cigarettes, it was high, and, but it's gone up even higher. So there has, governments have more and more relied on 
indirect taxes rather than direct tax. The consequence actually is that this hits the poor. This is the proportion of household disposable income accounted for by VAT in 1977, 1987, 1997, and 2012 is the little dotted line here. This is Incomes arranged in deciles, so the bottom decile, the poorest, second, third, up to the top decile, uh, wealthiest households. And what you see is that the proportion of income in the, uh, that is taken away by VAT in the poorest households was anyway higher in 1977 in the poor relative to the rich, but that has massively increased in the last... Uh, uh, 40 or so years, very substantially increased. So they are now paying around 15% of their household income is going straight back to the exchequer in the form of VAT. <coughs> Let me talk a little bit about energy. This is one of the things we particularly wanted to look at. Household energy... Uh, I've got to be careful here. My son is a trader with Scottish and Southern Energy, so, and he, uh, uh, he actually drove me here tonight, so I've got to be careful. <laughs> uh, household energy prices are up 74% in real terms between 2002 and 2012. Household energy spend is up 55%. The increase in the price has maybe put some people off consuming so much, but also energy efficiency measures have also led to a decline in consumption. The spend on energy accounts for a larger proportion of uh, poor household income. Uh, this is what we think uh, in terms of the household uh, spending share on energy, uh, the distributional impact, again, across the decile of net of. Uh, net household income, and we can only look at the period 2002 to 2012 in the UK in red and Scotland in blue. So in 2002, uh, energy costs around 5.5% of uh, the income of the poorest decile. By 2012, this had gone up to just short of 9% up here. It increased for all but it increased more among the poor. So this is how price changes can affect the uh, ability of the poor to access goods and services. Not about their income, it's about the prices that they face. Um, what about policies towards the environment? What role do they play in determining price risers? The main driver in, in, in uh, changing energy prices is, in fact, wholesale energy prices. Environmental and, and social costs only account for about 6% of the average dual fuel bill during the 2000s. <coughs> uh, rose to 9% after the 2013 autumn statement. The environmental and social costs is a lower fraction of the fuel bill in the UK than it is in most other U EU countries. The feed-in tariffs, this is a particular concern in Germany where they've gone completely berserk uh, over feed-in tariffs and encouraging relatively wealthy families to have solar panels. So they, uh, it's only the relatively wealthy who can afford the solar panels. They then get the benefit of the uh, uh, feed-in tariff and, they're <coughs> and the poor get nothing out of the, the, uh, out of the scheme. That hasn't gone on so far in the UK, but it's one of the reasons, I think, why the Treasury has rode back on, the, on these kinds of scheme. Um, <clears throat> some uh, energy policies have uh, been directed towards the poor, a lot of uh, insulation work and so on. Other policies, including the winter fuel payment, have become less generous and less progressive. The summary on energy uh, pr policy is energy price rises have increased inequality of disposable income. Environmental policy, though, isn't hugely significant in, uh, in the uh, uh, Scottish context. Um, 
carbon reduction has to be funded somehow. They just, the question is, should you be doing that through direct taxation? Scope for reform of energy taxation to price carbon effectively and mitigate distributional effects through the tax and benefit system. Maybe that's the way to go. Okay, let me now talk about the housing market. I think I'll stop after the housing market. I think I've gone on long enough. Um, one of the major changes that affects um, conditions of living in Scotland has been the way that the housing market has changed over the last, I can't subtract tonight, uh, 46 years uh, since 1965. The change in tenure has been quite uh, dramatic. 1.6 million homes were uh, local authority homes in 1965 that had fallen to 400,000 quarter by 2011. Um, we've seen a big growth in housing association homes. Private rented sector has been growing very rapidly. Uh, housing owned with mortgages has been rising and then falling because partly because the proportion of houses owned outright now has been uh, rising quite sharply. So that the, there has been a lot of action in the housing market. There has been a house price boom, which has benefited London in particular. So what I focused on before was the inequality of income and the effect that the GB main driver in terms of inequality of income is London. Now this reflects inequality in wealth because houses comprise the major part of most people's wealth. And so there's been a huge uh, upward drive uh, in terms of uh, wealth. That has not been so evident in Scotland, which has grown um, average house price from around uh, 60,000 to about 170,000 uh, over this uh, period. Nevertheless, that, may, that does change the distribution of wealth very significantly uh, over that period because obviously homeowners are the ones who benefit from the rise in house prices. So the housing fact, the housing bubble, if uh, maybe I shouldn't, I don't want to go into definitions of bubbles. P please, people don't ask me about definitions of bubbles. Um, uh, the demand factors, growth in population, particularly the growth in households because we've seen smaller and smaller households uh, in, uh, across the UK and in Scotland. Real income growth adds to demand. Financial deregulation and the availability of credit up until recently has had a huge effect. Falling interest rates have also helped. Um, a, and then feedback loops uh, uh, in terms of price rises themselves leading to higher demand. And we've got a constrained uh, and unre unresponsive housing supply. So Scotland's currently building half the targeted number of homes and affordable homes. <laughs> Sorry, that was a uh, uh, slip. Uh, what is the role of the uh, planning system versus a market dominated by few very large house builders. What we have found is that tenure changes in house prices um, don't seem to have affected the inequality of after housing cost income. So another way of trying to cut the inequality measure is to look at it before housing costs and after housing costs. So people are asked in detail about what costs they um, they bear uh, for their accommodation. And um, <clears throat> what we've done here is to look at the 90-10 ratio uh, of after housing cost income. So we're taking account of these housing costs, both in terms of the 90-10 um, measure and the Gini measure. And basically, there isn't a huge amount of change that seems to be driven by uh, this, uh, um, the developments, the changes that we've seen taking place between 1994 and 2011. <coughs> so, 
the extent to which this, these, the, the way that the Scottish housing market has worked has, and the effect that has had on inequality, I think at the moment we're, we're a bit, uh, uh, the jury's a little bit out on that. But what we have seen is that younger households are moving down the distributions and out, uh, older households are moving up. So if this is um, the uh, decile of after housing cost income, these are the 16 to 24 year olds, these are the 65 plus year olds. What you see, and this is the change between 1994 and 2011, there's been more growth uh, among the 65 plus group than among the 16 to 24 group after we take account of housing costs. So again, the picture by generation looks a little more clear that the young are, are suffering relative to older households. So virtually all growth in owner-occupied housing is accounted for by households aged 45 plus. The net decline in the number and rate uh, of owner occupation, uh, there has been a net decline in the number and rate of owner occupation among households aged under 45. The young are disproportionately affected by the decline in social housing. The proportion uh, um, of younger households uh, living in the private rented sector has more than tripled and the only, there's only a slight increase for older age groups. Average white weekly housing costs in the private re rented sector has increased by 90% in real terms but has remained stable for mortgagers because of it, the, the effect of interest rates. So those in the private rented sector are effectively having their net income reduced because of the effects of increases in the rents they're paying. The proportion of the young in housing property where 33% of their income is devoted to housing costs has more than doubled and it has remained stable or has declined for older groups. Adults aged 20 to 34 living at home has de increased from 20 to 25%. This is, this is a recession phenomenon across most of Europe particularly in southern Europe where rates of youth unemployment are unbelievably high, what has happened is far more young people are living at home with their parents. Um, so what may happen is that there are greater reliance on inheritance, so increase in proportion of young, including 60 to 24 who own their home outright, has... has um, <clears throat> increased despite declining ownership because they've been given an inheritance. And an inheritance are hugely unequally distributed. The mean UK inheritance is 12,500 pounds. The lowest quintile, lowest 20% is 1,300. The top quintile is 178,000. Huge, massive difference in the uh, uh, amount of resource being transferred from rich households to, to their children compared with poor households to their ch ch uh, children. So <laughs> rising inter the intergenerational equality may end up co um, causing more inequality among subsequent generations. I've got some more slides, but I'm going to stop now because I think I've covered quite a lot of material on what I've done. And uh, if there are any other bits and pieces, uh, I'm sure you'll ask me. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, David. I think the best service I can do, all of you, is to invite you now to put questions to David and to, to other David as well. If you could let me know who you are uh, and any affiliation. So we can start here with Joe, please. And then... Joe Elliott. I'm a trustee of the David Hume Institute. For... Um, in, in uh, physical development, the government is uh, 
or the developer is required to uh, produce an environmental impact statement. Do you think it would have any effect on inequality if governments were required, when putting forward matters of taxation and benefits, to have an inequality income statement in the same way? Um, can I answer that? Yeah, I'll go. You, you chip in if you want to. Uh, <clears throat> so, these are not too difficult to do, to be honest. Uh, <clears throat> so, what I think happens is that the um, Institute for Fiscal Studies does, the, does exactly what you're talking about, a kind of distributional impact statement, but always after the event. So the policy has been decided uh, within government and a decision made, and we're not party to why exactly that has happened, but the decision is made. And then uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies works out the consequences. But by then it's too, well, it may be too late to, uh, to have any significant impact other than on the, uh, whether the uh, uh, government gets a good press or a bad press. But the modelling in itself, and, and we're, we do a very similar sort of thing for Scotland, isn't, isn't that difficult to do, it's, uh, as long as the, the information on the relevant policy is available. Um, well, well, all I would add is that I think when the um, Treasury publishes the budget in the autumn <coughs> statement, it, it does include um, some analysis of the distributional impact of the direct tax and benefit changes. Um, but we've been talking about some of the sort of unintended consequences of policy, and these are things that are much um, uh, longer term in terms of their uh, um, impact on inequality and, uh, and are sort of, to a large extent, um, much harder to predict um, whether you can, or how effectively you can incorporate those sorts of analysis ex ante into your assessments, I don't know, but it would certainly be worth um, looking into. In the front here, please. I'm Neil Davidson, I, I run my own business. Um, if you were in charge of a, of a Devo Max Scotland, what, um, what policy measures would you have that would be most effective in reducing inequality in Scotland? What, what levers would you want? George, you can that. Clearly, the policy levers, uh, I mean, as, as David alluded to in his presentation, um, benefits are um, much more effective at reducing overall levels of inequality than the, the, the tax system generally. So you'd certainly want to think about... Um, uh, welfare benefits. Um, in terms of taxes, of course, um, income taxes, national insurance are key things in terms of addressing uh, redistribution, but things like inheritance tax, capital gains tax are also things that are uh, quite important. So all of those are things that you, that are potential levers. I'm not saying that um, necessarily there's a strong case for, for devolving them. That's a, that's a sort of different question. But those are sort of key levers from a fiscal uh, point of view. The, the caveat, well, there are a couple of caveats. One is um, the point that David made in the presentation that in Scotland, levels of uh, pre-tax and benefit inequality are particularly high. So uh, there's a limit, perhaps, on the extent to which you address these problems purely through the tax and benefit system. Uh, the, one of the other issues is the level of constraint that um, a devolved government or an independent uh, government uh, would face in uh, sort of making substantial unilateral changes to particular uh, levels of taxation. Yeah, I'd <coughs> uh, just to add um, to that, I, I, I think welfare is... A potentially an important lever, and I'm, I mean, most economists would say that that's a, that, the arg that there are strong arguments that uh, welfare should be retained at the centre. I'm not entirely convinced by them, uh, and I 
th I've been thinking about this. I've written something about it, which I'm hoping to uh, publish within the next few days. Uh, but the other thing, you know, there are levers that, um, in the longer run, seems to me, are 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 possibly more important, and these <coughs> centre around equality of opportunity and making sure that people get a good that young people get a good start and we have lots of evidence that that hugely matters and then making sure that they have access to the kinds of uh, uh, educational support from our colleges and universities and so on now we've been trying to do this for some time it doesn't i'm not entirely convinced that we've done a terribly good job uh, in terms of this but these are lev levers that that already exist Towards the back, please, and then. Thank you. Uh, Bob Black, uh, one of my current roles is to chair uh, an organization called the Housing and uh, Welfare Commission on behalf of, behalf of Shelter. Uh, could I start off, David, by saying what a tour de force that research is, and I'm sure it will become a reference document for years to come for policymakers. Ab ab absolutely brilliant. And it's, it's full of challenging messages. I suppose one of the overall challenging messages is how difficult it is going to be to implement any form of social policy against the reality of the impact of, the, of these policies on, uh, on, on disadvantaged groups. I mean, just to take two very quickly, there's the issue of um, rising energy prices and the rising proportion of disposable income amongst the, the less well-off groups uh, which are having to go on energy consumption. So how on earth do we tackle the whole issue of the green agenda and using price mechanisms against that background? What a, what a huge challenge that one is for, for politicians alone. And the other one coming close, closer to an interest which, which I've got in the, and colleagues have in the, the Housing Commission is how on earth can you make policy switches within the housing market, given that on the one hand governments continue to encourage people to, to try and leave themselves into home ownership um, at a time when we're probably, if we don't have another housing bub bubble, we're at least facing an, an issue of static uh, equity gains or possibly equity declines in, in, in the years to come. And at the same time, large numbers of people being forced into, well, large people, number of pe peoples are being incentivized to move into the private rented sector because of lack of any alternative, when the reality is, as we are pointing out in the, the, the Shelter Commission, that over 50% of houses in the private rented sector fail to meet the Scottish uh, housing quality standard. So <laughs> it's just a mes message of pes pes pessimism. And uh, I suppose the general question is, uh, what does this mean for other areas of policies such as uh, uh, the, green, the green energy debate and uh, the aff affordable housing debate. Do you want to have a go on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll have a go. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the green energy um, debate, I mean, these are policies that the UK's signed up to, of course, they have to be paid for uh, in some way. The, the IFS has, has argued that um, uh, there's a, there's a rationale for having uh, relatively higher prices for energy. I mean, that's sort of the, the purpose of some of these policies. But if you're concerned about the redistributive effect, you have to address that through the existing uh, earnings taxation and benefit system, um, but that you shouldn't sort of try to artificially keep energy prices um, down because that sort of undermines the, uh, the point of that policy agenda. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Just, mm. uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Duncan McLennan. Uh, I'm a consultant on assorted of mating at the University of Sydney. <laughs> 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 I also work on the Labour Human Foundation's workshop on housing, wealth, and intergenerational transfers in, in the UK. And I, I thought the presentation was fantastic and the stuff in housing really interesting. And you focused very much on the, the rental income side, uh, the after housing costs issue. 
I think that's a really difficult thing to interpret because these are not quality adjusted in terms of, it may be less accessible housing, it may be more transport costs. I don't think they actually get a really good measure, but I think you've done as good, good as you can. I wanted to uh, get to the question of whether or not you actually looked at the distribution of housing wealth and how it's changed in Scotland, because that's at the centre of Piketty's debate about housing in inequality in housing. And it shows that in a number of systems, again, your point, it depends how you measure it, uh, it shows that rises in wealth inequality have been particularly driven by rising inequalities in, in, in housing. Now, I think that's probably the case, and I wanted to uh, make three points about it quickly. First of all, we shouldn't give up on tax change in housing. We did change MIRAS in the early 1990s, and people might think a bit more about how they use property tax, stamp duty, and otherwise in ways that would be uh, more effective in the market. But I also uh, think the, uh, in relation to actually looking at the dynamics of this, I don't think the inheritance is really the issue. Our research shows that grandparents and even parents are transferring to kids to pay for school fees, to pay for university educations. In other words, it's going into their human capital formation long before you get to the inheritance. It's in-life transfers are becoming much more significant, reinforcing the social uh, inequality aspects. And the third point is uh, the econometric work that's been done in Australia and the United States shows if you're an early ba baby boomer, you do okay out of this. On the other hand, and I suppose depending on immigration policy, there's so many late baby boomers that will die in such numbers that may actually depress the real price of housing. So housing wealth inequalities in econometric studies go down. <laughs> My question to you is, did you actually look at the wealth distributions? And if you did, what would the recommendations would you make about changing the taxation of uh, housing wealth gains? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I can. I mean, in terms of the housing wealth, um, we haven't got good data over time, um, so we haven't been able to look at the the, the, the time series on the housing uh, wealth specifically. Um, in terms of, I mean, I, I think you, your point about. Um, income after housing costs, not taking into account the quality of the housing. I mean, that, that's a fair point, which is why what we then did was sort of uh, almost set that up as a sort of straw man, if you like, and we then sort of looked at the data in more detail and saw this issue about um, the fact that over time, um, the younger generation really haven't um, been part of this uh, big rise in home ownership, and, and they're the ones that are... Uh, accounting for virtually all of the rise in the, in the private rented sector. Um, and I do think that's important in relation to what it means for inheritances, because I mean, you, you touched on the point about this isn't just a, a question of inheritances enabling the subsequent generations to, 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 to purchase property. The, the wealth effects through the house price rises will also potentially affect subsequent generations through the um, bequests um, and so on for um, human capital enhancement, i.e. education. So it, it's a complicated um, issue. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested in the data on that because we, do, we struggle to get enough good data to, to, to uh, come to a con strong conclusion. The tax reform issue we touched on very briefly in the report, but that wasn't really the, the, the focus of this particular yeah. report. But we touched very briefly on the scope for um, tax reform tax reform in terms of potentially either taxing um, the value of the land or the value of the capital gain from the price rise, but that wasn't a main focus of this. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes to go, so brief questions please. There's one here and one down at the front here, please. A question for the two Davids, and that was great. <laughs> Maybe something you've still got in your slide there. Um, be curious to know if you've done any work on intergenerational income inequality in Scotland. I've seen some charts on bigger data sets you know, for different countries. And closely linked to that is, uh, I've only seen this for America, is where people are now spending money the most at different age bands compared to where they were spending it 30, 40 years ago. 
because I think these two things are very related to the other topic you raised rightly about the inhibitors to uh, equality of opportunity yeah. when almost we've got these tensions that yeah. are happening intergenerationally and on an older age group. Yeah, so um, <coughs> a, the, the answer is we haven't done that much as yet, but as part of the SRC um, Centre on Constitutional Change, we are working with the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in London who have done probably more work than anyone else in the UK on intergenerational uh, inequality. And um, our co-researcher has been on maternity leave for the ba This is a very weak excuse, but uh, for the last uh, few months, we're just about to pick that up again. But our inten the intention of that work is to, is to start to try to quantify the issue of intergenerational inequality in Scotland and it's part funded by the SRC. Um, Nastro Bradley, University of Glasgow. Thank you, David. That was very good. I just have a, a question in the sense that you focused on as a possibility the effect of uh, tax and benefits on reducing inequality. But the question is, it should not possibly be just limited to that, but you also have to possibly look at the causes of inequality. And if you go to the causes, post Kuznets, the development and growth economist in the 80s and 90s, very quickly realized when serial data came up that it was not an inverse U. It was actually a U. So you yeah. have rising inequality as development goes. And the two things that sort of influence that are two aspects. One was the labor market dynamics, which you mentioned, which is the lack of institutional bargaining power, which might influence different wages across the, across the band. And the other issue is uh, growth policies, that how well do you influence the sectoral growth in economies, how they shift with emerging economies, because if you're a technology, sorry, so if you're left, as you said, with Clark's untrained and unable so it's not only a question of <coughs> younger people, but it's actually managing the transition. So you do not possibly, the, the only way, uh, it should not be only limited to tax and benefits, but actually the policies that may influence these two aspects. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think, you know, I guess, uh, well, those few quotes that I gave at the start, suggests to me that the international organizations are taking an interest in inequality like they've never done before. Not entirely clear why, to be honest. Um, they haven't really said why, but, but they seem to have um, uh, joined on to this particular uh, theme uh, uh, at the moment. But um, a lot of the focus has been around the impact of technological change and globalization on the labor market. And I think um, maybe um, the international organizations are, are uh, um, putting their heads together and trying to figure out what uh, policies they might introduce that might reduce global inequality, but I don't see how you can do that without interfering with these mechanisms that I've, I've just described. I, I just don't see how it's going to happen. So I hope that they haven't raised um, you know, a, a, an issue that they're then not going to be able to come up with any clear solution because they go beyond the tax and benefits system because they, they're talking about international relationships and, and terms of trade and, uh, and so on. But I think your point's absolutely right. You've got to go beyond looking at tax and benefit systems. Okay. The gentleman here and then towards the back, Jenny. Stuart. Uh, Jim Gallagher, I'm a member of the DHI. Davids, thank you both. Um, two questions, quick ones. One about, about what governments can do and another about what maybe they can't. Um, first on what they might do. Um, should we have a wealth tax? Yeah. Is it time for one? The French seem to have one. Uh, we could even have a devolved wealth tax. What do you think about that? And the second, uh, perhaps more profoundly, um, 
what's striking about all of this is the extent to which inequality uh, is morally or politically justified. I think it's Paul Krugman uh, who argues actually that the politics drive the economics here rather than the other way around, that the mechanisms by which inequality increases, the economic mechanisms, are justified uh, by what he would have seen, I think, as a, a potentially a neoliberal project uh, uh, throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Do you agree with that? Do you want to go? <laughs> or I'm happy to, I'm happy to go. Um, so, so the question is basically, is, to what extent is, is this inequality justified? Is no, that the right? question is, uh, it, do the, does the political project of neoliberalism justify the conditions in which equal, inequality can increase? Well, the, the second yeah, so there's a thing called the Washington Consensus, yeah. uh, which effectively is the... Um, uh, Ten Commandments for that view of the world. And uh, there have been some recent, uh, recent interesting uh, articles suggesting that that consensus is breaking down, which suggests, yes, maybe there is an end coming to neoliberalism. I'm not clear what the alternative that is being suggested is. And that's why uh, I made the remark to the last question, you know, the... Uh, Christine Lagarde, um, the head of the OECD, and so on, are kind of raising this now uh, and, and arguing that inequality may be an impediment to growth, but they're not really saying how do we how do we intervene? How, you know, having having basically been uh, uh, poster boys for the the neoliberal consensus for a very long time, how do they suddenly change their stripes or spots and argue for a different way of uh, uh, intervening. On the wealth tax, um, I'm kind of, I, 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 can see the, I can see the argument for it. I, I mean, the, the land valuation tax might uh, move you somewhere in that direction and, uh, you know, there, could, there, there certainly could be good arguments on all kinds of uh, uh, grounds. Uh, for uh, for such a measure, and one of the difficulties with the with the wealth tax potentially, of course, is how you define wealth in such a way that you don't uh, distort decisions in other areas. So, if if wealth is is housing, then do people just start buying artworks or or something else? And and, and it, it's sort of harder to to define uh, where the boundaries of that might might be in, in a sort of non distortionary way, potentially. Jenny Stewart from KPMG, thanks ever so much for such an interesting and comprehensive topic. I was particularly interested in the living wage elements being a living wage employer and being part of the early work in the foundation. But my question was actually relating to the point about why are people bothered about inequality now? And so focusing in on the most urgent element of that which would probably be around the poverty debate, and we've obviously had Alan Milburn's report this morning. Um, but in terms of the work that you've done, if we're focusing on poverty as a subset of the inequality equation, what policy um, drivers would you think would be most effective to uh, alleviate those? So, I mean, it, 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 I think it's possible to kind of assume that inequality and poverty are the same things, and they're, they're not. They're, they're, they really are not. And uh, I think quite a lot of the debate in the last five or six years has been around, quite understandably, the relatively poor, many of whom are in work, finding that their wages are not growing as fast as prices, and, and now are in a sense almost in absolute rather than relative poverty. And that is, uh, you know, something of a different issue other than, than overall uh, inequality. Um, I guess, you, you know, most 
Or the, uh, there does seem to be consensus coming round to the argument that basically redistributive measures don't have huge effects on, n have huge negative effects on other economic outcomes that we might uh, want to promote, such as growth. So one might argue in favour of uh, uh, further measure. In fact, you know, the, the Scottish government and the universal credit are not the, the Scottish Government El Expert Welfare Group's approach um, and that of uh, the approach underlying universal credit are not miles apart. The problem about universal credit, in a sense, is that it's been introduced with the intention of reducing the effective rate of tax that those... Um, who are currently not in the labour market face when they go into the labour market or work longer hours. Unfortunately, it's been introduced at the time when they also want to, they've decided to cut the welfare benefit. So, although you might, uh, what, what clear, it, it is clearly desirable that people face as low an effective tax rate as possible when they move into work, work or working longer, um, trying to do that against a background, this, this applies to quite a lot of this stuff. We're trying to think about ways of reducing poverty, reducing inequality, when for the next five or possibly more years, we cannot uh, expect significant increases in um, public sector spending and indeed we if politicians were realistic about this, they'd be telling us that uh, over the next few years we can only expect cuts. Okay, look, I'm afraid, I'm afraid um, we have run out of time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm heartened that with the support of Alan McFarlane, the, the Institute has been able to make a contribution to better understanding of the question of inequality. I'm hopeful that we might be able to do more but we've got to where we are because of the efforts of David and David, so could you thank them in the usual fashion? Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming, and again, thank you to David Bell and David Isa and to Stephen Boyle for chairing the uh, session this evening. I encourage you to come to our next event in November. But in the meantime, um, we're serving drinks outside so you can continue the conversation there. Thank you. <laughs>